Hi everyone, Stepan here. Uh, today I'm going to go over my round 4 game of Lichtenraden Herbst. Uh, the tournament I played in Berlin and this is this was an eye-opener for me this was one of the toughest rounds to bear and a very tough game we played for more than five hours and yeah you're going to see so I played e4 for three years this was my only opening with white I only played the king's pawn never deviated never played anything else all of my games in the database are in e4 openings and everybody who prepares against me prepare against, prepares against e4. So after round 3, uh, when I uh, managed to lose a winning position, as you may have seen in the last video, uh, I didn't want to get into anybody's prep and I was facing a young player, 14 years old, uh, and usually young players are really good. And this uh, this guy uh, had one and a half out of uh, out of three, which is a really good score for a fifteen hundred rated player. So uh, my new opening repertoire consists of four different moves on move one for white, and one of them is the Nimtzo Larsen. So for this game, since he against e four, he plays the Petrov or some weird. Uh, lines in the Spanish and, the, in, and in the Italian. I didn't want to play e4, I wanted to play something else. I didn't like one, uh, what he plays against d4. Uh, I couldn't find any of his games against the English, so b3 it was. And of course there were no games of his against b3, so I didn't know what to expect. I was preparing for about three hours, mostly uh, going over the lines that I had already prepared, just to make sure that I don't that I don't miss anything, that I don't blunder in the open. So, the game begins b3, and he plays e5, which is the main move, which I was happy to see. e5 is by far the most popular move, and it goes uh, simply uh, for a strategy of controlling the dark squares. So b3, the Nimtzo Larsen prepares to fianchetto the bishop on the queen side early on. <coughs> I'm sorry, putting pressure on g7 and on the dark squares. Uh, on the king side, so e5 is a very sensible move. Bishop b2, knight c6 is the main move, still controlling the dark squares, mainly d4 and d5. e3, e3 prepares to remove the defender, a similar idea to what happens in uh, in the Roy Lopez, so we want to undermine the c6 knight to diminish the control over the e5 square. And in this position, there are a lot of moves. Uh, the main move is knight f6, d5 is the second most common, d6 is a very good move, g6 is a move, a6 is a move, knight g to e7 is a move, even f5 is a move. And all of these moves I knew. I, knew, I even prepared knight h6, which has only been played twice and is frankly a bad move. Uh, bishop d6 I've also looked at. So I was prepared for... 10 main moves in this position and my opponent played a move I've never seen bishop c5 and in this position after bishop c5 uh, I spent more than 30 minutes which is a never a good thing of course especially since this was the first time I played this new opening and I didn't want to be surprised that's the only thing I wanted to avoid and I was basically prepared for 95% of anything that could happen in the first 10 moves. My preparation was really thorough. And on move 3, I'm out of prep, I'm out of book. So, what was I considering? Uh, why is bishop c5 a rare move? And why is it a strange move? And why did it make me think for, for 30 minutes? So bishop c5 uh, doesn't control g7 anymore. And one of the most common ideas in the in the Nimtzo Larsen is to play f4, undermining the e5 pawn. So the first thing I was calculating was f4. And if I play f4, can he take or not? One problem with f4, of course, is that it allows queen h4 check. So my first calculation was f4, what if he takes? Well, first, what if he doesn't take? If he plays d6, which is a fairly sensible move, f5, uh, let's say knight e5 and knight f3. Whenever you can play knight f3 uh, without your f-pawn on f2, that's favorable for white uh, in the Nimtzo Larsen. That's much better because then you have pressure along the f-file and it's just easier to play. So something like knight f6, knight c3, and the game goes on. Uh, it's, it's just a normal game. It's equal. 
Uh, the other thing after f4 in the critical line, of course, is e takes f4. After which, the question is, can I take on g7 or not? Can I win the rook or not? So let's say, well, if I don't take, my position is just worse. Because if I, if I take the pawn, then he can just take my knight, ruin my castling rights, and he should be better. So if I play f4 and he takes, I basically have to take on g7. So what if I take on g7? The critical line, once again, wasn't hard to calculate. Queen h4 check. The only move I have is g3. And the only move he has is f takes g3. And now the situation gets complicated. So obviously he can win my rook or my bishop with check if I take the rook on, on h8. So if I take the rook, my game is basi basically lost. So check. Uh, where does the king go? The king goes here. This is the only square. Mm -hmm. And now he probably should take my rook with check and just get two queens and be completely winning. Okay. So after e f4, uh, bishop g7, queen h4, check g3, f takes g3, the only move I saw was bishop to g2. And after bishop to g2, he can check me with g takes h2 check. And after he plays g takes h2 check, I play king f1, he takes my knight with check, I take, and there's no way for him to defend his rook. So in this position, uh, once he plays, <coughs> I'm sorry, let's say he plays either d6 or d5 or knight g7 or something normal, uh, let's say d6, I just take the rook, and now if you count the material, I have two bishops and a knight and two rooks, he has two knights, two bishops and a rook, uh, for that he has a pawn, so he has a pawn for the exchange and white, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, no, not d6, I'm sorry, the queen is hanging, so let's say he saves the queen first and they take the rook, and in this position I think uh, white should be just winning, the problem is that they couldn't see all of the bad moves or all of the other moves that he could play they couldn't see whether I'm getting checkmated or not so I spent a ton of time calculating f4 and after that e takes f4, bishop takes g7, queen h4, check g3, f takes g3, bishop g2 so from this position on I was really confused they couldn't visualize the board they couldn't see whether I'm winning or not whether I'm losing or not I basically couldn't decide what to do if I turn on the engine now, you can see that my calculation is correct and takes here, king f1, takes here with check and white is uh, simply winning more than plus 2. Okay, so after bishop c5, I had calculated f4, that was the first thing I was calculating and I said to myself, well, you don't see that it doesn't work, so okay, leave it as a candidate move. The other move I was calculating, uh, which seems very tempting, is d4. Uh, d4 is a very interesting move because after e takes, e takes, uh, he should probably retreat the bishop. Okay, if he plays bishop b4 check, then simply c3, and he should probably retreat the bishop all the way back, and something like bishop d3, and white should be better, d5, knight f3, I'm just, I'm just overwhelmingly better in this position after castles, ahead in development, and I have much better pieces, you could even argue that his d5 pawn is weak and I will also play c4 very early on and open up the position. Okay, uh, the critical line I had to I had to look at is d4 e takes d4 e takes d4 bishop b6 and whether I can play d5 or not. Because if I can play d5 and attack the knight, attack the g7 pawn, then I obviously win. But there was this problem, queen e7 check, bishop e2 and now knight e5. And this is what I didn't like. I couldn't see what to do here. Let's say I play something like knight f3 check. Then he simply takes. I have to take with the g pawn. And they have no other sensible ways of developing. This pawn is slightly overextended. If I play something like c4 later on, my dark squares are really weak. So after bishop c5, I didn't really like d4. I didn't really like f4. Uh, the sensible move that I could have played, which I knew was fine, was something like knight f3. If I play knight f3, he can never play uh, e4 because I simply take on g7. So he should play d6 and I play bishop b5, continue developing normally. Probably bishop b6, something like d4, ed4, knight d4. And we have a normal Nimtsol Arsen where I'm still playing against the g7 pawn. Okay, uh, and the last move I was calculating, which I ended up playing in the end, unfortunately, was a blunder. So after more than half an hour, uh, looking at all of these options, and I have to admit that I, I wasn't calculating them correctly, I was going over one and then coming back to it, and then going over all four at once, 
I was indecisive. I played a move that uh, seems to prepare f4, but fails. I played queen g4, which from a much better position for white, because bishop c5 is a mistake and f4 should be played, uh, queen g4 is just a mistake. I expected him to play queen f6, which uh, I thought was the best move. Apparently, a knight to f6 gives him a huge advantage because I cannot take on g7. If I turn on the engine uh, and I take on g7, something like rook g8, and my position is unpleasant. Now, all of a sudden, there are no weaknesses on the long diagonal. Uh, I have won a pawn, but my queen is horribly misplaced. And I have no development, no king safety, and his rook is perfectly placed. So that's what he should have done. Instead, he played queen f6, which I expected. And now I could continue normally, something like knight f3, or knight c3, or bishop d3, or bishop c4. Uh, the problem is that with queen g4, I already felt committed, and I wanted to continue what I had calculated. So my calculation was f4. Okay, now he of course cannot take because the queen is hanging and there's no queen h4 check. d6 attacking my queen and I calculated queen to e2. And I thought at this position I had to be slightly better. I couldn't have been more wrong. This position is much better for black. He simply plays knight g to e7. I play knight to f3. He still cannot take on f4 because his queen is hanging. And now he plays g queen to g6. And all of this I saw. Uh, I saw this before I played queen to g4 and they thought d4 in this position was good for me so he is attacking my c2 pawn he's also threatening knight b4 to double attack my c2 pawn and the only way to save the position is d4 after ed4 ed4 bishop b6 uh, one thing i missed here is that i can play knight c3 so i ended up playing knight a3 which is equal so if I turn on the engine now, the position is just equal. If I play the move knight c3, uh, you might be wondering, well, what about knight takes d4? Well, if knight takes d4 happens, then knight takes d4, and he cannot take with a bishop. If he takes with the bishop uh, on d4, then I simply play knight d5, threatening checkmate. The only way to save checkmate is to, to retreat the bishop, and that's it. Then I'm going to just take on c7. So let's say he retreats the bishop, I take, he has to take with the queen, otherwise it's checkmate. Now I check here and the game is over. So, well, okay, maybe not. Wait, no, 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 sorry. Yeah, what I, okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I can just take the queen, Jesus. Okay, <clears throat> so it, in some other lines where the queen doesn't defend f6, I end up taking on c7 and, and winning the rook. In this line where he takes with the queen, I just take the queen. So basically there is no better defense. After knight to d5, uh, yeah, he would just have to give up everything like this. And first I attack the queen, he takes and I take the bishop and, and that's over. So that's what I missed after bishop b6. And I ended up playing knight a3, which isn't a good move because d4 pawn can't have be ta been taken. Bishop f5, double attacking c2, now we both castle. And in this position, after he castled, uh, well, Pause the video if you if you want. Uh, it's extremely hard to calculate this, and I couldn't see everything, but I still went for it. So similar to what I was calculating with f4, does d5 work here? Uh, pause the video and calculate d5. Okay, so d5 obviously wins a piece. Uh, the the e7 knight. The problem is that the c6 knight is coming into b4 as soon as I play d5. And then I'm fairly close to getting checkmated. So, in the end, uh, I decided to play d5. And since he is lower rated, uh, I basically have to win I, unless I, well, if I draw, I lose a million points. So d5. So I went for it, risking. I couldn't see if I get mated or not. Knight b4. Now, the problem is uh, that, okay, the a2 pawn is unpre. If he takes with the bishop on c2, then my king has no squares, and I need to make squares in order to survive. So, uh, I did take, and now my calculation was he should probably take on c2 immediately. Now, if he takes on c2, if I take with the knight, then it's checkmate. Okay, that much is clear. Uh, if I play rook d2, then knight a2 is checkmate. 
And the only move I could see that I have is knight h4. And after knight h4, knight takes a2, I would have to play king d2, and he would probably play bishop a5 check, and I would have to advance my king further. Now, he doesn't win my queen because I'm still attacking his queen, but when he plays queen h5, the position gets very complicated. I couldn't see all of this, but I thought that I may survive, and I'm not getting checkmated, I'm still a piece up, and who knows what's going to happen. So I figured, well, I may outcalculate him, let's go for that, and I, I wasn't sure if I'm getting mated or not, but I was 90% 90, 90 sure that I can survive. And the one thing that I knew for certain is that if he attacks my queen first, then I'm winning, and he did that. So rook h to e8, and now white is just winning after queen to g5, because I'm forcing a trade of queens, and there's no way for him to checkmate me now. So if he plays bishop c2 now, I take the queen first, and he doesn't have anything in this position. Okay, so let's say he takes on c2, I take the queen, he takes with the bishop, I can do whatever I want. Uh, I don't, well, the a2 is going to drop, but that's really not that relevant, and I can do, I can do basically a lot of stuff. So let's say I just develop my bishop, prepare to, prepare to double my rooks, if he takes on a2 can go king d2 and the position is fine for me something like this and wait or not i have to be a bit more careful okay yeah probably knight c4 okay knight c4 so now if he takes he can go here and he doesn't have this check and he basically has nothing here so i'm, I'm going to win i'm going to win his bishop Okay, rook h to e8, queen g5, uh, he didn't play bishop takes c2, which is not a good move in this position, he played bishop e3, and now the position is tricky, once again, uh, rook d2, for example, doesn't work, uh, moving my king away doesn't work, I get, I get horribly uh, outplayed and probably mated or lose more material, the only move here which I had seen in advance is knight to d2. And now he has only one option, and now bishop takes c2 is the move, now that my king doesn't have the d2 square. So now, if I don't do anything, he's going to take on a2 and checkmate me, so I have to take the queens. He, take, he takes with the bishop, and now he's once again threatening checkmate. If I, let's say I develop my bishop, let's say I play bishop c4, knight a2 is checkmate. Okay, so I have to move my bishop, and this was the second, well, the third critical point in the game. Uh, what do I do here? There are two candidate moves. Uh, one move that is fairly obvious is bishop takes g7. And I didn't spend a long time calculating that move because I didn't like bishop h5. I didn't want to end up having a position, a pawn down and uh, two pieces for the rook, because I thought his pieces were too active. So something like bishop uh, takes g7, bishop h5, I have to play g3, otherwise rook g8 wins my pawn back. And bishop takes d1, king takes d1, knight takes d5, bishop b2. And, okay, six pawns for black and two rooks. I have uh, a knight and bishop for a rook and a pawn. In hindsight, this is completely winning for white, and I should have gone for this. But during the game, I wasn't sure that this was the best option. So after uh, bishop takes g6, I have to move my bishop away. I played bishop c3 and gave these two pawns. So knight takes, king b2 only move, knight takes, king takes, bishop takes f4. And I thought that this position, where I've kept my piece and I have two knights and a bishop for two bishops and two pawns, uh, three pawns, I'm sorry, should be much better for me. And I played well. But the ending, uh, the ensuing ending, which we got, is really hard to win. Mm -hmm. So okay, bishop d3, bishop takes, king takes, rook check, King c2, rook e2, g3, simply saving another pawn, bishop takes d2, rook takes d2, rook d2, e8, rook d1, a6, stopping knight to b5, which is a good move, now knight b1, king d7, knight c3, rook to e5. If I turn on the engine, this position is more than plus one for white, but I think I would rather be black here. I think it's much easier to play with three pawns than with a knight. Uh, maybe a bishop would be more useful in this position because the center is sort of blown open and it would have been easier to control some key squares. The knight was kind of awkward to maneuver. So, okay, 
rook f1 putting pressure on f7, f6. Rook f4 preparing to play rook g4. Rook h5, which I didn't think was a good move. I don't think that does as much. Knight e4. And now knight e4 uh, prepares a threat, uh, taking on, on f6, so I can take, uh, well, not in this position, well, okay, a funny blunder would be like, taking on f6 here, because he can take my knight. Of course, if he takes my rook, I can I can take here and, and have a winning position. So after knight e4, I'm setting up some threats, but I'm not really threatening that much. Knight e2, e5, and now rook g4. Uh, there's no easy way to defend. If he plays f5, then I take on g7 with check. Uh, if he defends with the rook, uh, then I I think I would take on g7. Yeah, okay, so rook to e7 is a blunder because I take on g7. And if he takes, I take here and win, win the rook back. And after rook e7, rook takes g7, he cannot take my knight because his rook is now pinned. So after rook g4, the only sensible move was king d8. Uh, now, of course, uh, if I if I take on g7, he takes my knight. So knight c3, backing up. Rook e7, defending. Rook f2, preparing some tricks once again with rook takes f6 and getting some checkmating ideas in, which don't really work. I basically wanted to complicate the position and play tricky moves that threaten something to get him lower on time. King e8, which is a good move. Uh, rook d4. Uh, I want to get my rook back to d2. Uh, king f7, and I want to get my knight into e2. f4. I'm sorry. f4 and uh, e6. Rook h to e5. Rook d2. f5. Knight f4. G6. And now, knight e6 is a move, but I wasn't sure that it works. Turns out it's it's a very good move. I was always afraid of c6. So knight e6. I was afraid of c6. And I couldn't see what to do. If I try to check, I don't really gain anything with that. I would have to go back, and once he takes, my position is busted. But there's a tricky line with g4, c takes d5, knight d4, in which his position would be very weak. These pawns are now useless, and I could probably be much better after something like this. Uh, just doubling up uh, my rooks here on the pawn and putting pressure on his position would be enough. Instead of that, I, I didn't see that. I played knight to e2, king g7, knight c3, getting my knight back, rook e3, rook f4, b5, rook d1, uh, and now after b5, rook d1 is a very serious threat. He has only one move in this position, and that's rook e1. If he doesn't play rook e1, then I play rook a1 and, and win the a6 pawn and win the game. So rook e1 was correct. Rook d2 back, of course I don't want to trade off the rooks. Uh, if we get a position where he has 3 pawns for the knight, it's it's just a draw. Rook 1 to e5, and now b4. And here I was happy because I achieved something imp important. So I'm 3 pawns down, and for the moment my 2 pawns and my rook are blockading his majority on the king side. My 1 pawn on b4 is blockading 2 pawns here, and my 1 pawn on d5 is blockading 2 pawns on d6 and c7. So after b4 and, and with the d5 pawn, I was happy because his pawns are not powerful. And in order to utilize them, he would either have to get his rooks behind or in front of the pawns or sacrifice one of the pawns. Okay, so rook e1, rook f2, f2, uh, and now I'm preparing to play rook e2 if he plays something active. King f7, king b3, rook a1, rook f2, e2, trading rooks. Uh, if he doesn't accept the trade of rooks, let's say he moves his rook, then I'm going to play rook a2 and just have a winning position, once again winning the a6 pawn. So he has to keep the rook there, rook e8, and now rook a2. Uh, after, uh, sorry, king e8. After king e8, he offered the draw, and I declined. Uh, if I turn on the engine, it's plus one, 1.7, and the position is in theory winning for white, but it's hard to win. So here, uh, he took on e2, and I had an option. Uh, I had to choose between taking on a1 and taking on e2. I chose to take on e2 with check, which was the wrong decision. If I take here, he takes my h2 pawn, I take on a6. And it's not easy to defend this for him. But if something like this happens, I should probably be better. And... I'm not sure how he should be defending this, and 
unfortunately for me, I I thought that the other option was better. So after rook, rook takes e2, I took on e2, we check. King d7, king c2. I wanted to get my king into the center, rook h1, uh, king d3, rook f1. Fourth critical position of the game. Uh, okay, is f4 a serious threat? That was the question. I thought it wasn't, and I played rook a2, and he played f4. Now, there are four ways to react to this threat. Three ways, basically. Uh, one of them, well, four. Okay, uh, g takes f4 is one way, uh, obviously, and after rook takes f4, I can then take on a6, uh, and he can take on b4, which I thought was just bad. So, g takes f4, rook takes f4, rook takes a6, rook takes b4, rook a8, I thought was a draw. And I think I'm correct. After f4, the other option is just rook takes a6, fg3, uh, hg3, rook f3, check, king d4, king, uh, rook takes g3, and knight takes b5. And this I thought was better for white, but I wasn't sure how to win this. Something like rook b3, uh, king c4, rook b1, rook a8, rook c1, check. And something like this happens where I should be better, but I... I don't know how to win this. Okay, so the engine says it's plus five, which is easy to see when you have an engine, but during the game I, I couldn't see all of that. And after f4, I thought I found a winning variation, so I played rook to e2. Of course, uh, if he takes on g3, I take the rook. If he plays f3, I take the rook, so he has to play rook h1, which I calculated. Rook f3, and now f takes g3, and I took with the h pawn. Taking with the king is also an option, and as you will see uh, in a few moves, taking with the king uh, would have been just winning for me. Okay, instead of that, I took with the h pawn. He, of course, plays rook c1, this is the only move. I play rook a3, this is the only move. And now, with about 10 minutes on the clock each, well, I had 15, he had 10, he plays the trickiest move in the position, which I thought was impossible. Uh, pause the video uh, and figure out if a5 works for black, if you want. Okay, so he played a5, and my calculation before he played a5, of course, I've considered that, I always consider pawn breaks, was, yeah, yeah that just doesn't work, because... I have b takes a5 and once he plays b4 i can play a6 once he takes my rook i can play a7 and that's what i was looking at so let's say he takes my knight i take a queen and i should be easily winning in this position the problem is if we go if we go here f takes g3 taking with the king would have meant that this position is winning so let's let's take with the king king takes g3 Rook c1, rook a3, a5, b a5, b4, a6, takes the rook, a7, and white simply wins. Now, what's the difference? The king is on the g-file, okay, and there's no way for him uh, to get behind with check. When I took with the h-pawn, my king is on the f-file, so in this same variation, after f a5, takes b4, a6, takes a7, he has rook f1 check and when i move away he has rook f8 and saves the day wins the game the game is over so after a5 uh, i figured out that he has rook f1 check and i was devastated because this is now a draw at best for me if i'm allowing a5 and i cannot punish it then the position is just a draw now which other options did i have uh, I can do something like uh, knight a2 attacking the rook, takes, takes, and this should be just a draw. I don't think there's a way for him for him to lose this position, something like knight d3, and I, I think the position is fine for black. I would rather be black, because the fewer pawns we have on the board, it's it becomes less and less likely that white can convert this, because if we get a position rook and uh, knight against the rook, it's going to be a draw. And now he can just trade off both of my pawns. And the third option I had after a5 was, of course, knight takes b5, pawn takes b4, uh, rook b3, rook c4, king e3, and, I don't know, rook g4, something like this, and king f3, which is just a draw. So in, a position, in the position after a takes b4, rook b3, uh, he played, he actually played rook c5, I 
took on b4, he took on d5, and we agreed to a draw, which I was really happy to get in this position, because black is the only side that can win. Objectively, this is a draw, but white has no way of winning. Of winning. There's no way white can win. Black is the only one playing for the win, and he shouldn't have uh, agreed to a draw. I said, do you, want to draw? do you want to draw? He was really happy to accept, I guess because he's lower rated, and, well, a draw against somebody 400 points high rated is a good thing, but he should have played for the win here. So, after five hours, I drew. At two points during the game, I believe I should have lost. Uh, I think knight f6 instead of queen f6 after queen g4 was better. And instead of rook h to e8 attacking my queen after queen takes e7, simply bishop takes c2 was uh, much better for black. Let's just see that position. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Okay, queen takes e7. If we turn on the engine, yeah, okay, bishop takes e2. I have to play knight h4. He has to take here. I have to play king d2. There are no other moves. Bishop check. I have to play king d3. Queen h5 saves his queen. Bishop e2. I have to play. And as you can see, after queen h6, it's well, even if I do get to trade the queens off, this is a very unpleasant position for me because when he takes, takes, he can take my exchange. I take with the rook. And the material count is I have two bishops and the knight. He has knight, bishop, and two rooks. I have five pawns, he has seven, so he basically has um, uh, he basically has two rooks, bishop, knight, for rook, two bishops, two knights, and he has a couple of extra pawns, so I think this position would have been much better for black. I'm not saying that he would have won that position, but it's just easier to play. And he sort of quickly, after queen takes c7, played rook h to e8, which I was happy to see, and which, to be honest, I had expected, so, yeah. Uh, so it didn't go well the first time I played the Nimtso Larsen. I'm still going to keep playing the opening. I don't think anything can surprise me as early in the game as bishop c5 did, because now I learned bishop c5. I learned all the other moves that have only be been played once or twice. By the way, bishop c5 has been played only twice in history. Yeah, uh, a tough game, and after the loss in the previous round, I now lost another 6 or 7 rating points. So from a very good start of the tournament, the tournament was now going really poorly and I had to pick myself up and continue. Okay, uh, see you tomorrow for round 5 and round 6. I'm going to analyze both games. Uh, I hope you like this game. Uh, let me know what you think and stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.